Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Maggie, a professional MCAT tutor, but today I will be helping you with the AAMC free practice exam, BB Passage 2. If you're not familiar with this channel, it's run by me and my brother. We are both medical students in the Southeast United States, and we were professional MCAT tutors before we started our company, Informing Future Doctors, and this channel. Now we give out almost all of our resources for free. If you wanna hear more about all of our projects that we have going on, stick around until the end. All right, so by now y'all should know about how I like to go about these. I like to first go down and see the title of the passage and it's called genome biology. Next, I'm gonna go through the passage and flow chart it. If you're not familiar with flow charting, definitely go check out our flow charting uh, videos. Um, but for now, I'm basically just gonna be picking out the important relationships in the passage and kind of writing them down on the side. The microbiome has been investigated for its possible link to non-hereditary diseases. Crohn's disease is a non-hereditary chronic inflammatory condition that may affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract. Causes for CD have not been defined to date. However, research has shown that the profile of the GI tract microbiome is different in healthy versus CD-affected individuals. Therefore, researchers hypothesize that differences in bacterial distribution and the host immune response to GI tract bacteria might play a role in the establishment and progression of the disease. So there are a few things that I actually do want to write down on my flowchart. Microbiome linked to non-hereditary diseases. And also I want to write down that... Um, there's evidence that the microbiome might be different for healthy versus uh, Crohn's disease patients. That's really all I got out of the first passage. They look like they're just kind of setting it up for now. GI tract bacteria digest dietary fibers and convert them into butyrate, propionate, and acetate. Uh, these three molecules modulate the innate immune system response by attenuating the inflammatory response to GI tract commensal bacteria. Furthermore, butyrate is a major source of energy for colonocytes. So there have been a, a good bit of like basic sciences here. They're probably not going to test you on the ins and outs of Crohn's disease. That would be like something that you'll encounter in med school, but they will test you on the underlying thing. So the innate immune system, we should know a little bit about that. And John has a great video on the immune system too. You should recognize some of these structures and maybe know like that a colonocyte is probably just a cell in the colon. I'm not really going to write down anything else on my flowchart. The GI tract microbiome of healthy individuals exhibits a predominance of gram-positive bacteria, firmicutes, and bacteroidetes, and a reduced amount of proteobacteria and actinobacteria. This is in contrast to the microbiome of individuals with CD who have an increase in the number of gram-negative proteobacteria, whereas the number of firmicutes bacteria is highly reduced. I'm not saying any of these bacteria names right, by the way. So I'm gonna put healthy, gram positive, and CD maybe more gram negative. There's a little more nuance to it that's obviously that we just read about, but I just kind of want it on my flowchart somewhere. You see why we call this a flowchart? Because I mean, these ideas kind of lead into each other, so I can really just use arrows to kind of say what I want to say. Treatment with 5 amino salicylic acid and reduced proteobacteria without affecting the number of any other bacteria in CD affected individuals. Okay, so I do want to write down that actually. 5 amino salicylic acid reduced proteo in CD. That's kind of a lot to write down. That's more than I normally do, but I kind of want to. That point sounds important. I don't really know. Bacterial characteristics and variations of microbiome between healthy and CD-affected individuals are summarized in table one. Great, so all this crap I've been writing down is just summarized in a table. That's perfect. Okay, so we are going to do some figure interpretation here. Always read the title first, bacteria analyzed in the large intestine. Now go down and read any notes. Um, so one star indicates highly reduced and two stars indicates highly increased number of bacteria in CD-affected individuals compared to healthy individuals. Uh, PS indicates polysaccharides, LPS indicates lipopolysaccharides. So that's a lot of notes, but I, I think that they're important. So now we kind of look at uh, the columns that are actually in the table. So we have bacteria, gram status, the energy source of the bacteria, and the product, I guess, of metabolism in the bacteria. Um, and you can see that there are stars or double stars on all of these. So these are all indicating, um, I'm guessing, like CD-affected individuals. At least that's kind of what I was getting from the note. So now that I am oriented to the table and what all the stars mean and everything and where I can find everything, I'm really not going to like look at it. If it was like a graph that had lines or something or that I needed the results from, then I would look at it. But this is just a lot of words. I'm not going to waste time. Going straight into the questions from table one, which bacteria can use galactose as an energy source? So this is perfect. We actually do have to go back to the table. 
So this is our energy source column right here. So this is all that we're going to be paying attention to. Now, do you see galactose in any of the things? No, that would be way too easy. So let's look at what we do have. Acetate, succinate, um, polysaccharide plus acid, glucose and its isomers. That's throwing up. Let's come back to that. Polysaccharides and glucosamine, glucose and polysaccharides. So if you kind of were able to look through here and you have a good idea of what galactose is, you would know that galactose is an isomer of glucose. Galactose is a um, monosaccharide and it's an isomer of glucose. So um, the only one that can use galactose in theory would be this odorobacter, which is answer choice C. But let's look at the ones that they also listed. Ruminococcus... Um, like I said, galactose is a monosaccharide, so polysaccharide would not encompass galactose in this case. Um, Fecalibacterium. Again, kind of same thing here with the polysaccharides. Glucosamine is um, something found in cartilage. It doesn't have anything to do with galactose. And then um, Vasco-lactobacterium. Um, succinate is not the same thing as galactose. Um, so here we have Adorobacter being the only one that would really make any sense. Next question, number six, from table one. Again, okay, so again, we're going back to table one. In which metabolic process are GI tract bacteria directly involved? So if I just go up to the table right now, I'm not really going to like know what they're talking about. I'm not going to really know what I'm looking for. And so I'm actually going to peek at the answer choices real quick and see what they're, what they're going for. So we have conversion of polysaccharides and short-chain fatty acids, absorption of amino acids, uh, fibers into peptides, or absorption of monosaccharides. So really, if we were just going to simplify this question down, it's just asking, like, what are these bacteria doing? Like, metabolically, what kind of reactions do we see? And the only, like, thing that we have to go off of is their energy source to their product. So this is going to be our reactants over here, and this is obviously going to be the products. And so metabolically, like, what's happening chemically? What's happening? So A says conversion of polysaccharides into short-chain fatty acids. So... In the bacteria that have polysaccharides as one of their reactants, do we see short-chain fatty acids? I would definitely consider butyrate to be a short-chain fatty acid. I don't really know that I would consider acetate to be a short-chain fatty acid. I don't, I don't really know. That's kind of splitting hairs. It's so small. But butyrate would definitely be a short-chain fatty acid. So that is uh, looking like a good answer to me. And if you are not familiar, this, this, is, the, uh, this is butyric acid or butyrate. Absorption of amino acids. So our... Any amino acids, you should know those like the back of your hand, are any of those used in the reactant side? Um, no. And also, we wouldn't really know about the absorption status anyway. So we can kind of mark that one out. C, fermentation of dietary fibers into peptides. So we were told, do y'all remember up in the passage? I like that. That language sounded so similar to me. I went back and looked. Um, it says that GI bacteria digest dietary fibers and convert them into butyrate, propionate, and acetate. It does not say that they convert them into peptides. And we also don't have any proof over here that there are any peptides that are being made uh, from any fibers. So I don't really like that one either. And you might like, just, just know that like none of these are, none of these are peptides. They are different classes of macromolecules. Peptides would be like protein things. And all of these are probably considered like short chain fatty acids or something like that. Um, I know that's the case with like butyrate and propionate. D says absorption of monosaccharides. So this one could be confusing because you do see a bacteria that use monosaccharides. Um, but be careful about the language here because it says absorption. And just like in answer choice B, we don't know anything about the absorptive status in the colon. Uh, being able to break down glucose into acetate is completely different than being able to help the colonocytes absorb glucose or any of its metabolites. So we don't want to make a logical leap here and say that that's helping absorption. So the answer choice would be A. Number, I think this is seven. Based on table one, what is most likely associated with a reduction in gram-positive bacteria? So you'll remember that a reduction in gram-positive bacteria probably is pointing to Crohn's disease. So I think what this is asking is it's going to be about the stars, like the, the double, like the single and the, and the double stars and everything. It's going to be asking about those and saying which one of these is related to um, more symptoms of Crohn's, Crohn's disease or whatever. Um, and we, we will know that by what's in the table. I'm explaining this poorly. Let's just, just get into the answer choices. A says an increase in acetate production. So let's look closely. So this bacteria... And this bacteria are the acetate, oh, and this bacteria 
are the acetate producers. So if we saw an increase in their um, populations, then we would probably see an increase in acetate production. What we're looking for is would an increase in acetate production be kind of like the same thing as like Crohn's disease? Like, like would we see a reduction in gram positive bacteria that may point to someone having developed Crohn's disease? So let's look at the stars that are beside our acetate producers. A single star means that this bacteria is actually reduced. So we actually see a reduction in two of our big acetate producers. The double star means that this is increased. So we do see an increase in Clostridia, which is an acetate producer. But overall, we have two down arrows and one up arrow. I think that that's probably netting down. So we actually see in Crohn's disease patients, CD-affected individuals, that's the people who have the stars by them, we actually are going to see a decrease in acetate production. So that's not right. This question uses a lot of like reverse words. Like we have to really like think about what we're doing, what we're looking at. An increase in the use of acetate. So now we're going to look at our acetate users, which would be Rosaburia. So if we saw an increase in acetate uh, at being used, increase in the use of acetate, then that would probably mean that we had more Rosaburia in our system. Is that the case for CD-affected individuals? No, right? Because there's only one star beside this. So there's actually a decrease in Rosaburia in CD-affected individuals. And maybe it would have been helpful to honestly um, just mark this out and say associated with CD affected individuals, because that's what the question is trying to say. It just wants to make sure that you remember the fact that there's um, less gram positive bacteria in CD affected individuals. So we marked out B. C says a decrease in pH. Now, where do we see anything that has anything to do with pH here? We see this, right? We see a proton right here. And that is like the only place. So this is actually um, a reactant, right? This, this proton is a reactant. And so, Let's kind of work in a different direction and see if it makes more sense for, for some people. We have one star beside this rumino Okay. Um, so we have a decrease in the amount of this in CD-affected individuals. So we are going to be using less protons. So we are going to have more protons, which is going to do what to the pH? It's going to decrease the pH. So we are going to see a decrease in pH in CD-affected individuals because they don't have as much of this, this bacteria as indicated by this star. So I like C, a decrease in PS production. So none of the bacteria that they looked at are PS producers. So that's kind of off the wall. So the answer here is C. The next question says, based on the passage, the microbiome of CD-affected individuals will result in which physiological change? So now this isn't asking about the table. This is asking about the passage. And pretty much it is asking you a little bit about like in Crohn's disease, what kind of physiological change do you see? Now, it says based on the passage, so you don't have to come in knowing really anything about Crohn's disease. We learned a few things in this passage about Crohn's disease. What did we learn? We learned the difference in the microbiome. We learned a little bit about maybe some treatments or future treatments. We also learned the kind of mechanism of the proposed mechanism of, of a Crohn's disease. So let's see if we can find anything in the answer choices. Increased polypeptide digestion. So I'm like looking through right now and trying to like find where it would say something about like polypeptide digestion. And I just can't really find anywhere where it talks about polypeptides. So I'm just I'm just going to leave A there. B says slower dietary fiber absorption. So I see two problems with that. One is that we don't digest fiber. That's kind of the whole point of fiber is to like bulk up our stool and everything and like cause osmosis and make your um, BMs normal. But that's the first, first problem is that, um, Fiber does not get absorbed. So this, this answer choice is kind of confusing in that way. Um, another problem is that I don't see anywhere we, where we talk about fiber absorption because this is a research article. So hopefully we're not talking about things that like don't exist, but there's really not a reason for you to pick this. Even if you didn't know that we don't absorb fiber. So moving on C says increased amount of propionate. So I do see in our table right here, I know this is a question based on the passage, but our table is going to kind of help out here. So we do see some products of propionate right here. Those are in the bacteria that are lower in CD affected individuals. So we're not going to have an increased amount of propionate, right? We're actually going to have a decreased amount. So definitely not. D says decreased immune tolerance. So we did talk a little bit about the innate immune system here and the GI, the microbiomes, um, 
role in it just a little bit. We also talked about how Crohn's disease was a chronic inflammatory condition. So it is starting, if we can kind of piece this together, it is starting to sound like the proposed mechanism of what Crohn's disease is, is a difference in the microbiome that affects your immune system and leads to chronic inflammation. So even if you didn't come in knowing that that's kind of like what Crohn's disease is, you could kind of get to to this conclusion by seeing how A and B don't make any sense, seeing how C is kind of the opposite of what's actually happening, and how D, they're trying to piece it together throughout the passage, even if they never really explicitly say it. All right, next question says, based on the passage, to which phylum does Enterobacter most likely belong? Um, Enterobacter, for a second, I thought you were going to have to like know some microbiology, and I was like, ew. Um, anyway, so Enterobacter is sitting right here at the bottom of the table. We see a little bit about its gram status. It's negative. It uses polysaccharides as an energy source, and it produces LPS and lactate. So our choices here are actinobacteriae, formiculate, and bacteroidetae. The only way that we're going to be able to like know anything about how Enterobacter fits into phylum or anything is that we should know that like gram positive and gram negative is, is, is like a major thing in um, bacteria taxonomy and just classifying them in general. So if Enterobacter is gram negative, it's definitely not going to belong to a phylum of gram positive bacteria. So where are we going to find out the gram status of these other things? in the passage. So right here in this last part, it says gram positive bacteria of firmicutes and bacteroidetes. <laughs> so we know that these are both positive, right? So enterobacter cannot be in that phylum. We were told um, that these people, the healthy individuals have a reduced amount of proteobacteria and actinobacteria, but we weren't told what their gram status was, so I don't want to make assumptions. We were told in the next sentence, though, that proteobacteria is gram negative. So if we know for a fact that proteobacteria is gram negative, then that would be a safe bet. You can also look at the fact that enterobacter was increased in individuals with CD and that it was, we were told that people with CD have an increase in proteobacteria and firmicutes was reduced. So that's just more evidence that it's proteobacteria. All right, the last question said, which product is partially reduced in CD-affected individuals? So again, it kind of sounds like we're going to have to go back to the table and um, find out like which bacteria are reduced in CD-affected individuals and what their products are. So if these are our reduced bacteria, we're going to see reduced amounts of butyrate, reduced propionate, reduced acetate, uh, reduced acetate, propionate, butyrate, H2, H2S. (laughs) and reduced butyrate. Oh, I just now looked and saw that this is particularly reduced. So which one did I say like three or four times? I said butyrate like several times. You can also look at the fact that um, the bottom two are our increased bacteria. And so we actually are going to have an increase in acetate, which kind of like makes acetate not so special. Like we could actually just kind of come out even on acetate, but we definitely are going to have less butyrate, right? So that's like a safe bet. All right, that wraps up the passage. I hope it was helpful. If you wouldn't mind, hit the like and subscribe button so that we can keep making this kind of content for you guys. If you're currently starting to study for the MCAT and you have no clue where to start, there is a link in the description below for our complete four-month MCAT plan. If you're already in the midst of studying and you're just looking for a community, we have a link in the description below for our Discord channel. Honestly, pretty much everything that we do is down in the description below and it's all linked. So definitely go check that out. Until next time.